Good evening and uh, welcome to lesson 14 of CE 3372 Water Systems Design, Fall 2020, and I'll do the standard introduction so there's still a few minutes for uh, people to get here. And uh, today's lesson is a continuation of last time regarding open channel flow and its role uh, theoretically and in the hydraulics involved in uh, collection systems, in particular stormwater and wastewater, which are the only two collection systems that kind of make sense for water systems. So I'm at the Blackboard site for the class and it's sort of running. It's running a little slow this afternoon. Um, it was working pretty pretty okay this morning. And so there's the gradually varied flow. I'm verifying it's there. And I think that's all I need to do. So I'll select that and take the link uh, to the content server. And we have kind of a small get together this evening. Okay, five, cool. But I will proceed accordingly and get this, uh, get through this. It sounds like it's painful, um, but it's not. So, so today's uh, lesson is on uh, stormwater collection, hydraulics, gradually varied flow, and the uh, discussion today also applies to sanitary sewers. Uh, there's there's no major difference hydraulically speaking. In the data links section on the content server, there are a collection of spreadsheets and some R scripts. We'll visit those at the end of the lesson today. The video links are not active yet. And it's the same reading selection from Tuesday's lesson um, is offered here. And uh, a lot of what I'm presenting is derived or, or mentioned in some form in this first reading, Open Channel Flow by Robertson, Cassidy, and Chowdhury. And let's proceed with the lesson notes. So um, here's today's notes, and we're going to look at uh, the second steady flow regime of some consequence for drainage design, which is the gradually varied flow uh, regime. And in that, we will look at the principles of uh, specific resistance equations, which are going to be the Manning's equation, the concept and definition of something called specific energy for a channel or a cross section, and the definition of supercritical, critical, and subcritical flow. I also says normal flow here, uh, but that's what we discussed last class meeting on Tuesday. Uh, quick review of uh, Tuesday's uh, discussion, open channels are conduits whose upper boundary of flow is the liquid surface. Storm sewers and sanitary sewers are examples of systems um, that are designed to operate as open channels. Keeping in mind that usually storm sewers and sanitary sewers are underground, so they're still pipes, but the intent is that they'll have a free surface in them. And the uh, hydraulic principles are friction, gravitational force, and pressure force. And again, review from last lesson, for a, any given discharge Q, the flow at this section is described by its depth, the cross-sectional area, so the geometry, the elevation and the mean section velocity, and recall that the flow depth relationships are non-unique. So the knowledge of the flow type is relevant, and we'll see uh, more manifest of that statement uh, in today's lesson. Again, we'll review nomenclature in, in this set of uh, presentations. Um, I attempted to use drawing tools, and the rendering is a little off uh, when it was translated to the new uh, presentation software. But it's, it's, it's good enough, I think. So uh, here is a, a slope channel sloping from 
left to right, so downhills to the right. And the flow depth at a station or a section is measured from the channel bottom. And in this uh, treatise, the depth is indicated by the symbol Y for flow depth. The elevation of the, of the bottom of the channel above some datum is indicated by the symbol Z for elevation. Um, notice in this drawing that because the channels slope, the uh, true perpendicular depth, which is indicated by the dashed arrow in the drawing, is different than the uh, distance going straight up from the channel bottom to the sky, uh, the solid arrow in a uh, label Y. Now that um, difference is, 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 for the most part, trivial in a real system, and so whether we're measuring true perpendicular or just going uh, vertical up from the datum is irrelevant. Uh, it certainly is going to matter when the slopes start to get uh, physically quite steep, and, and I have no mental, uh, mental feel for how steep that is. It's one of those things you, you'll kind of know it when it happens. Uh, if, if that was a 45 degree slope channel, that's steep indeed for longitudinal slope, um, those two distances would, would differ by some multiple of the square root of 2. Uh, so at some point it's starting to matter. But for the most part, we ignore that discrepancy. Um, the slope of the channel bottom, called the channel slope, or I have used the term topographic slope in the past, um, or the slope of the profile grade line, or the slope of the flow line, uh, those are all trying to convey the same thing, um, is S sub 0. And then here's uh, this triangle showing one unit of run S0 units of drop. Similarly, we can examine the slope of the water surface. And here it's labeled as the slope of the water surface elevation. We have one unit of run for uh, S WSE of drop. And this dashed blue line is supposed to coincide with the water surface. Uh, it's a little, it's a little twisted. Uh, Oh, it's a little turn. It's too turn. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's supposed to coincide with the uh, water surface and, and be the hydraulic grade line. So that's not me trying to trick you all. That's just a drawing um, error that uh, creeped in when the graphics were translated from one software to another. The other um, uh, slope we consider is the energy grade line. Here it's shown as a dashed red line, and it is a distance, it's located a distance of V squared over 2G above the hydraulic grade line, and its slope is S sub F, uh, historically called the friction slope, and its run is one unit of run for S sub F units of drop. So now we have uh, all three major parts. We have the uh, bottom of the channel. We call that the uh, profile grade line. We have the water surface, which is the hydraulic grade line. And we have the energy component, which is the energy grade line. And so the total energy at a section is the sum of Z elevation plus Y, the flow depth, plus V squared over 2G, the velocity head. Like a closed conduit, the various terms uh, appear as mass, momentum, and energy balances. Unlike closed conduits, the geometry, and hence y and velocity, are dependent on the flow rate. And the, and the pressure term is replaced with uh, the flow depth. So the uh, nomenclature for open channels is listed in this uh, figure. The pressure head in an open channel at the bottom of the channel, so at the, at, the, at, the, at the water solid interface on the bottom of the channel, 
Uh, the pressure head is equivalent to the flow depth at that point, and the usual symbol is Y. The velocity head has the uh, same meaning as in uh, regular Bernoulli's equation, so it's V squared over 2G, or Q squared over 2G A squared. The elevation head is conventionally taken as the distance from the measuring datum to the bottom of the channel, or in this case, the symbol Z. And the um, open channel total head is the sum of the three terms, Y plus Z plus V squared over 2G. The channel slope can be related to the uh, spacing between two sections on it. So if this section here is on the left side is section one, and on the right side is section two, and they are L units apart, L can be distance and like maybe a, a thousand feet apart, then the channel slope is equal to the elevation at the upstream section minus the elevation at the downstream section divided by that distance. Typically, channel slopes are positive in the down gradient direction, um, although it's, it's possible that the uh, slope can change and you can get a negative channel slope. Those are called adverse slope channels. The friction slope uh, is similarly defined as the total head at section 1 minus the total head at section 2 divided by the distance between the two sections. Uniform flow, we saw in our last meeting, is the case where the depth does not vary along the channel. And in general, in uniform flow, the slope of the, of the water surface would be the same as the slope of the bottom surface, and it would also be the same as the slope of the energy grade line. So in uniform flow, the depths in this drawing, Y1 and Y2, would be equal. If that were the case, the velocity terms at each end would also be equal, and that is because the flow depth is the same, the cross-sectional area is the same, hence the velocity is the same. <clears throat> and again, if that were the case, the friction slope would be the same as the bottom slope, and this dashed line would be parallel to the water line, parallel to the channel bottom line. The gradually varied flow means that um, that's, that's not too true, that Y1 and Y2 don't have to be equal, uh, but it does mean that the change in Y as we're moving downstream is relatively small compared to the horizontal distance delta X that we move. Um, so not, not like a waterfall. Um, in that case, the water surface takes on the hydraulic grade line definition and the energy grade line um, is not necessarily parallel to the water surface. Uh, for example, in the sketch that's on the screen right now, uh, it shows that the depth at Y1 is a little smaller than the depth at Y2 so the water is starting to pool up as it moves downstream. That would imply, for a prismatic channel, meaning the geometry is the same, that the velocity at Y1 is a little bit larger than the velocity at Y2. The only way this is going to pool up is the, uh, because as it pools up, the cross-sectional area of flow increases, the velocity has to decrease to maintain a steady flow rate. The energy equation for section 1 and 2 in, a, in using the modified Bernoulli principles that we had earlier in the class uh, would be Z1 plus Y1 plus V1 squared over 2G would be the total energy at station 1 is equal to Z2 plus Y2 plus V2 squared over 2G. The total energy at station 2 plus any head loss getting from 1 to 2. So that's, that's just uh, the energy equation in terms of our open channel energy components. Z is the elevation component, Y is the pressure component, V squared over 2G is velocity head as before. 
So we can observe that there are uh, two terms in the energy equation uh, that involve the flow depth, which is uh, the um, flow depth itself and the uh, velocity term. And these two terms can be joined together in a derived um, term that's called the specific energy for the channel. And the specific energy for the channel uh, does not consider the elevation. It simply considers the um, properties of flow at that cross-section. So the flow depth plus the velocity head at a cross-section is the specific energy at that cross-section. <clears throat> so in the drawing here to the left of the uh, collection of equations, um, there's two red bars. There's a red bar on, at, at section one, which is comprised of the flow depth at section one, plus the velocity head at section one. And there's a red bar at section two, which is comprised of the flow depth at section two, plus the velocity head at section two. And so this E1 in the equation and the E2 in the equation correspond to those two red bars. E1, of course, corresponds to the leftmost red bar, and E2 corresponds to the rightmost red bar. And in the drawing, the uh, leftmost red bar is taller than the rightmost red bar. And so it's implying that there is certainly a <clears throat> change in spe specific energy between the two locations. And that change is um, accounted for by any change in elevation plus any head loss. So using that definition of specific energy, we can um, take our modified Bernoulli's equation, do a few manipulations, and write it as E1, the specific energy at section 1, plus Z1 minus Z2, the change in elevation, is equal to E2, the specific energy at section 2, plus the head loss. And then with that structure, we can um, observe that Z1 minus Z2, the change in elevation, can be replaced as S sub 0 times delta X, or the bottom slope times the spacing between the two sections. Similarly, the head loss uh, is uh, replaced as the friction slope times the distance between the two sections. And now our energy equation is E1 plus S0 delta X equals E2 plus S sub F delta X, where S0 is the bottom slope and S sub F is the friction slope uh, for the section. And that is the um, energy equation in a gradually varied flow sense. And it's used to relate the flow rate, the geometry, and the water uh, surface elevation in our channel. And keeping in mind our channel can be a pipe. The left-hand side that incorporates the channel slope relates to the right-hand side that incorporates the friction slope. So what this is saying to me is the specific energy at section one plus any gravitational forces pulling water downhill is equal to the specific energy at section two plus any frictional forces uh, resisting downhill flow. And we can rearrange that a bit um, to come up with the following expression. S sub zero, the bottom slope, minus S sub F, the friction slope, is equal to the ratio of E2 minus E1 to delta X. So the, the <clears throat> change in specific energy from downstream to upstream, divided by the distance between the two. And we can get fancy here and apply that calculus stuff and take the limit as delta x goes to zero or visualize that these two sections are getting closer and closer to one another. And uh, as the spatial dimension vanishes, the end result is the change in specific energy with respect to x is equal to s zero minus s sub f. 
And with that um, statement, uh, we can make use of the chain gang rule of calculus and rewrite DE DX as DE DY, the change in specific energy with change in flow depth, multiplied by dy dx, the change in flow depth with change in location. dy dx just so conveniently happens to be the slope of the water surface elevation. So we implicit in this we have um, somewhat a tool to allow us to determine what the water surface looks like uh, based on bottom slope, friction slope, and known geometry. Um, let's uh, examine the DE, DY portion. The change in energy with flow depth is equal to 1 minus Q squared over GA cubed DA, DY. And let's see where that came from. That came from differentiating this part of the expression. So the change in uh, energy with change in y, the 1 comes from uh, dy, dy, and the q squared over ga cubed comes from um, differentiating the velocity head with respect to flow depth where it's expressed in discharge form. So there's a little bit of algebra that's hidden away in this uh, statement right here. So anyway, we have 1 minus q squared over ga cubed dA dy. And it just so happens that this term, q squared dA over ga cubed dy, happens to be the square of a dimensionless number called the Froude number. And so we can also write this as 1 minus the Froude number squared. And make that substitution, we have s0 minus s sub f equals 1 minus the Froude number squared times dy dx. And rearrange that one more time. And we now have dy dx equals s naught minus s sub f over 1 minus the Froude number squared. The left-hand portion of that expression, dy dx, is the variation of the water surface elevation, or, or it's the slope of the water surface. And, and the right-hand side contains a term friction slope that's dependent on discharge and section geometry, and a Froude number which is also dependent on discharge and section geometry. And uh, this equation is, is the basic equation of gradually varied flow. And it relates the slope of the hydraulic grade line to the slope of the energy grade line and the slope of the bottom grade line, the profile grade line. And how we use this is we integrate that differential equation to find the shape of the water surface. And it gives us information like how, how full a sewer will become for a given geometry. So before we present that integration, and keep in mind it's integration as a concept. Um, there's almost, there's very few real geometries that we can perform analytical in integration like we learned back in calculus, but the concept of recovering flow depth as a function of position is, is the result of integrating that equation. So before getting to these water surface profiles, we also need to um, discuss the idea of critical flow and critical depth. So our specific energy expression is that specific energy is equal to y plus q squared over 2ga squared. So that's a y plus the velocity head. And for a fixed value of q squared, whatever it is, um, once, once the flow rate is established as a constant, the changing of the value y uh, is going to produce a curve that looks something like the one that's drawn in the left-hand uh, sketch. So as the uh, flow depth gets small, the y part gets small. But also if the y part's getting small, this area is uh, getting small. We're squaring it, so it's getting smaller fast. And so the 
q squared term starts to dominate, and that's why the energy starts to rocket up here. And then uh, at some point, it has a minimum. There's a value of y at which the specific energy is smaller than any other value of specific energy. And then as we move to the right of that, it's, it's starting to gain energy again. This uh, diagonal line is a one-to-one -one line, and that's the um, that's the E equals Y line, if you will. And it represents the fraction of energy that is attributable to whatever the depth is. And because the specific energy is depth plus velocity head. So a portion of specific energy is depth, and that's this distance right here. And then the remaining portion is kinetic energy because of velocity head. Um, so, so that uh, establishes the depth energy function and, and shows what we mean by a minimum. Uh, that, that minimum location is labeled y sub c, and that's going to be called the critical depth. A more um, common way of plotting this is on the figure to the right. And it's that it's that same figure um, rotated about the y-axis. So you flip the e down and then rotate it to the left 90 degrees. So we have y on the up-down axis and specific energy on the left-right axis. We're still at the one-to-one -one line. And so for a given depth y, if we move to the one-to-one -one line, that tells us what portion of specific energy is attributable to the flow depth. And then the remaining portion is attributable to the velocity head. And there'll be a point uh, where the energy is a minimum. And that's called the critical energy for the section. And the depth at which that occurs is called the critical depth. And the flow regime associated with that is called critical flow. Um, critical flow occurs at this minimum value of y sub c. And let's see what we can learn about that from our um, DE, DY function. So at the critical depth, the, that derivative of specific energy with respect to depth has to equal zero. That's the necessary and sufficient condition for a minimum to exist. And so keeping that in mind, let's write DE, DY out is equal to 1 minus Q squared over GA cubed multiplied by DA dy. And so that gives us the change in specific energy with respect to depth. Let's look at this DA dy term. Uh, back when we were defining the depth area top width relationship, we had this little sliver of water that represented a, a very small vertical component dy. And when multiplied by the top width at that depth, we have this shaded panel, which is, the, which is the DA panel, and that gives us the necessary relationship between depth, area, and top width. And that relationship is the um, differential area DA is equal to the top width at the depth of interest times DY. So we can um, replace this DA with T over with T DY. And T dy divided by dy is just going to leave T. And so our DE dy function now is 1 minus Q squared times the top width over G A cubed. Keeping in mind that the top width is a function of y of depth, and the area is a function of y of depth. Um, so at the At the critical depth, that gradient is equal to zero. And so what we have is um, this q squared t over g a cubed uh, has to equal one, because one minus one is what makes zero. And this whole group of terms happens to be a fruit number squared. So you may have encountered fruit numbers before in your fluid mechanics class, or possibly in the hydrology class. Um, and if you've never heard of it, it's, it, it's, it's a dimensionless number, uh, much like the Reynolds number is a dimensionless number. It, the Froude number happens to rate, 
relate the ratio of inertia to gravitational forces. So it, so it relates um, essentially the momentum of the water to gravitational forces that are trying to pull it downhill. Um, the critical flow occurs when that Froude number takes a value of 1. And uh, the depth at which that occurs is called a critical depth. And we're going to look at uh, how to uh, find numerical values of it for a rectangular channel. Um, so keep in mind, the top width and the area are themselves functions of depth. But first, there's more. Uh, returning to the original way of representing it with energy on the up-down axis and depth on the left-right axis, um, at critical flow is when we have our energy minimum. And uh, if we move, in this case, to the left, the portion of specific energy uh, that's attributed to velocity head increases while the portion that's attributed to depth decreases. And these are um, regimes of supercritical flow. And supercritical flow gets its name from the Froude number being bigger than 1 in supercritical flow. And so your know, Froude number can be 2 or 11 or 17, something like that. And you know, in the case of a Froude number of 17, uh, there's not very much flow depth, but there's going to be a whole lot of flow velocity. So uh, a useful... Uh, memory tool is if the uh, flow depth is thin, so it's very shallow flow, but it's moving really fast, like when you uh, squirt water out of a hose through a nozzle to blow leaves into your neighbor's yard or into the, um, into the gutter in the street so that we can fill up the storm sewer, um, which is not a good use of a storm sewer, but people do it all the time. Uh, that's super critical flow. Um, moving in the other direction, um, as we move deeper than critical depth, the velocity component of energy starts to decrease, and more and more of the specific energy is uh, a consequence of how deep the water is. And those are called subcritical flow regimes. They get the name from the value of the Froude number and subcritical flow being less than 1. Um, and it's actually constrained at 0. So subcritical flows occur with Froude numbers between 1 and 0. Supercritical flows occur with Froude numbers greater than 1. And I've seen in the literature occasional references. You know, Froude numbers in the 20s are not unheard of. Um, a few years back, I conducted some research where we were actually looking at a supercritical flow. We were able to produce fruit numbers in a laboratory of six or seven. So um, that, that kind of gives you just a mental image of what those numbers can be. Um, in subcritical flow, fruit numbers of 0.75 and greater uh, are hard to tell just by looking at the flow. They look awful fast, but they are uh, classified as subcritical because of their Froude number. And then the uh, kind of the slow, lazy flows that we're accustomed to in a um, in a large river, for instance, uh, those have Froude numbers somewhere in the 0.4 region, but it's going to be very specific to uh, whatever river it is. Uh, so that should give you just a brief uh, mental feel of how those numbers range. Um, let's suppose we need to find critical depths, and we have to do that for a classification scheme that's coming up. So being able to find the critical depth is somewhat important, and it can also be a nuisance depending on geometry. But let's start with our friend the rectangular channel because it's a fairly simplistic geometry to consider. It's a useful geometry. We build real channels that are rectangles, uh, so this is not just an academic exercise. Uh, the channel width is capital B in this case, and the channel depth is Y. So our depth area function, A of Y, would be equal to B times Y. 
And the depth top width function, top width is a function of flow depth y, is simply the constant b. We make the substitutions into the uh, critical depth requirement where that fruit number becomes equal to 1. And so we have q squared times t divided by g a cubed. Make the substitution. So we have q squared b over g b cubed y cubed. Um, simplify uh, as, uh, as much by dividing out the b from the numerator. And we have q squared over g b squared y cubed. And we can solve that because that equation is supposed to equal 1. So we can solve that for y, and we come up with y critical is equal to q squared over g b squared raised to the 1 third power. And um, that is uh, the critical depth in a rectangular channel. And a lot of times uh, we, we do a cop out. And, even in natural channels, we, um, we pretend that they're rectangular enough for a critical depth. And that's probably not a bad uh, approximation. And it's, I imagine it's probably pretty close. And we'll play the same game again with a trapezoidal channel just to see how it would change. So the depth area function is by plus y squared over m. And the depth top width function is b plus 2y over m. We make the requisite substitutions into the food number squared equals 1 requirement and come up with q squared times the quantity b plus 2y over m divided by g times the quantity by plus y squared over m cubed. And in this case, uh, it would be fruitless to do uh, the algebra. Uh, it probably can be done. Um, but um, good hydraulic engineers are inherently lazy, and we would go, well, we'll just beat this to death with uh, numerical methods. We'll just guess a value for y and uh, see if it evaluates to 1. If not, we adjust the guess accordingly. Um, this, this particular one would be quite amenable to Newton's method to solve it, but trial and error is probably adequate. It's not going to take you that many tries. We can program a computer to do it for any geometry, and that's all we'd have it do is implement a, um, either Newton's method or a bisection method to find values. We'll do one example with numbers. Let's suppose that the channel is conveying 500 cubic feet per second. Bottom width is 20 feet. Side slope is 1. And so what that would mean is that the, that the angle of the sides is 45 degrees. That's pretty steep for a side slope, but uh, such side slopes exist in the real world. Um, that's steep enough that it would have to be reinforced somehow, so possibly a concrete wall or cement stabilized soil, although I'm not sure that would be stable enough, so I don't know. And so we'll make the uh, substitutions into the um, Fruit number equals 1 equation. So this is from the prior uh, analysis. And now we're going to just put numerical values in. So everywhere there's a b, we replace it with a 20. Everywhere there's a y, we're going to leave y b. We'll leave y alone. Everywhere there's an m, we'll replace it with a 1. And for the q, we'll replace it with 500. So we come up with um, 1 is equal to 500 squared over 32.2 times uh, the quantity 20 plus 2y divided by the cube of the quantity 20y plus y squared, and that equals the fruit number squared uh, of y. And so to actually find the value of y that makes it equal to 1, uh, the easiest way is to uh, code up this equation and guess a value of depth. In this case, the first guess is 1. We compute the fruit number squared. It comes out to be 18.4. And we say, that's, that's too big. That's super critical. We're looking for critical. So increase the depth. 
New food number is 2.2. Still too big, but we're moving in the correct direction. Increase the depth again to 3. Food number is 0.6. That's too small. It's subcritical. So the critical depth is somewhere between 2 and 3 feet. We could split the difference, go to 2.5, and, and we get a food number of 1.09, which is probably good enough. Um, but let's say we're a little bit um, precise. So maybe go to 2.56 and get a food number 1.01. That's probably acceptable. And we would state that the critical depth in that channel under that flow condition is 2.56 feet, which for those of you at home without a calculator is going to be 2 feet, 6 inches, and let's see, 6 hundredths of an inch is six and a half. So two feet, six and a half inches deep. And we're down to half an, half an inch at this point. And in, in real water, we probably can't even measure that precisely. Because all real water has a little uh, waviness to it. Uh, so that would be a trial and error approach to finding the critical depth. Similarly, we can play the same game with circles. Um, the the fundamental complexity with circles is having to take the flow depth and compute this angle and then that enters into the other uh, uh, depth top width function and the depth area function. But if we make the substitutions we get the fruit number squared as a function of depth is q squared d sine alpha over g times the quantity d over 4 squared alpha minus sine alpha cosine alpha cubed. And so what we would do is we supply an input guess of y. From that guess, we compute alpha. And then once we have alpha, the rest of this is evaluated. Okay, so we've seen this uh, diagram before. And the result of that diagram and the analysis is the gradual varied flow equation. And to find the water surface profile, we want to integrate the depth taper with distance and add to it the position of the bottom. Or in terms of calculus looking like stuff, the integral from x0 to some point of interest, x1, of dy dx, which is our fruit number equation, uh, our gradual varied flow equation, plus uh, dz dx over the variable of integration of dx, which when we make the substitutions is x0 to x1 of s0 minus s of f over 1 minus fruit number squared. Um, dx plus dz dx dx. So all this is, we don't actually do the evaluations in this way. This is just a notation. It's saying recover the flow depth relationship, add to it the bottom elevation relationship, and that produces the hydraulic gradient. So to do that, um, the integration has to proceed in a meaningful direction. By implication, we're starting from a location where we know the flow depth and the other properties of the channel. And depending on what the relative uh, slopes are and the type of profile uh, determines a, an integration of direction. By direction, whether we integrate from that known location moving upstream to recover the backwater curve or integrate from that known location moving downstream to recover a front water curve. And uh, to make that determination, we have to uh, classify the slope. Classifications are steep, critical, mild, horizontal, and adverse. And these classifications are not based on what we human beings think are steep and mild, but they're based on the relationship between normal depth and critical depth. So a steep channel is a channel whose normal depth is smaller than its critical depth. 
A critical channel is a channel whose normal depth is equal to its critical depth. A mild channel is a channel whose normal depth is greater than its critical depth. A horizontal channel is a channel whose bottom slope is zero. An adverse channel is a channel whose bottom slope is negative, meaning it's sloping uphill. So with those um, slope classifications, we can next discuss profile types. Uh, there's a type 1, type 2, and type 3 profile, and then these are combined with whether it's a steep, critical, mild slope um, to determine the integration direction. Uh, it's called a type 1 if the computed depth is greater than critical and the computed depth is greater than normal depth. It's a type 2 if the computed depth lies between critical and normal, either bigger than critical, smaller than normal, or bigger than normal, smaller, smaller than critical. Uh, and it's a type 3 profile if the computed depth is less than critical depth and the computed depth is less than normal depth. And here's a collection of hand-drawn sketches of some different flow profiles. Um, so here's a mild profile type 1. And the importance of these sketches is uh, it gives us an indication of uh, what the channel conditions might be. So these occur when there's something downstream that, that's controlling the flow. So maybe it's um, coming up to a... Uh, to a culvert system and the flow is backed up upstream of the culvert system and it starts to pool. Um, the resulting curve is called a backwater curve and the integration direction for any numerical or analytical methods would be from the known location moving upstream. A mild uh, 2 profile um, is still downstream control but this would be the case where the water is starting to accelerate um, to make its way around a curve in the channel or there's a change in slope or it's gone over a, uh, a low water crossing, if you will, and it's accelerating on the other side of that. So it's still downstream control. It's still subcritical, uh, but uh, we would also up integrate moving upstream. A mild 3 profile is uh, a upstream control, so maybe flow that's coming out from underneath a sluice gate, and it, it exits the sluice gate supercritical, and it's working its way um, towards normal depth, and at some point there'll be a hydraulic jump, but uh, initially um, <clears throat> we have a case where there's upstream control, and we would be integrating moving downstream. So we would go from the known location and work our way downstream. We have the same set for uh, steep cases. The only difference is the uh, curvature. In the case of a steep type one, it's still upstream integration. Steep type two is um, also um, moving upstream integration. And then a steep type three, would be uh, downstream integration. And there's numerous other examples, and it says here, look at any hydraulics text. So let's go ahead and take a look at one and see if my assertion is true. So I'll look at um, this particular one. And may have gone too far. So here is a, a small chart of the different profiles, type 1, type 2, type 3, and the different um, slope classifications and what the water surfaces look like in those regimes. And it gives you guidance on whether we're going to integrate moving downstream or upstream from a known location or a control point. And they have a few um, representative sketches and a example problem. I think there's another example problem. 
and you believe it at that. So with the flow pro profiles, we have to identify control points. And those are locations where we know the water depth uh, for, for some reason. So if it happens to be water's flowing over a concrete apron, for instance, under a bridge, it's going to pass through critical depth in that vicinity. So we have critical depth because we can compute that. So we know a depth there. Or we have a water ponded up behind a weir and we know what its depth is. And the control points are where we start the integration and then the um, type 1, type 2, type 3 indicates the direction to integrate. And we'll just look at a, a couple of examples of numerical methods. Uh, as a practical matter, outside of this class there would be no need to calculate these yourselves, you would use uh, software uh, to do the calculations for you. And we're going to use SWIM as representative software uh, for these kind of calculations, uh, but heck, heck grass will do it too. <clears throat> so there's, there's two numerical methods. Um, one is called the variable step method, and in the variable step method, what we'll do is we will um, establish the specific energies of the two sections, and we'll find the distance that they are apart. Uh, so the reason it's called variable step is this, this delta x is what's solved for, uh, so we don't necessarily have it coming at um, uniform locations in space. We can make it do so, so we can, we can jack with the uh, E2 every time to get stuff to come, to come at uniform locations in space. But there turns out there's a other methods to handle that. So let's uh, proceed forward. So this is always uh, presented um, initially because it's actually a very simple and elegant uh, approach to using the energy equation to find the water surface profile. And so as an algorithm, we would start with a section from a known depth. We would calculate the specific energy for that section. We would calculate the friction slope for that section. The friction slope we would obtain from a Manning's equation rearranged uh, for uh, the slope as the unknown. <clears throat> we'd adjust the, the depth slightly, either to make it uh, smaller or larger, depending on our best uh, initial guess of what the flow profile is, M1, M2, M3, and then calculate the specific energy at the new section, calculate the friction slope at the new section, compute an average of the two friction slopes, and then use that in this expression to solve for delta x. And presumably we know where the bottom is, so we should have s sub zero. Then we would move to the next section and repeat the process. Uh, so let's, let's look at an example where we have a rectangular channel that's one meter wide, carrying 2.5 meters cubed per second of discharge, bottom slope one part in a thousand, Manning's end of 0 0.025, and the water, we're told the water flows over some weir, and it's exactly two meters just upstream of the weir, and we want to compute what the water surface profile looks like uh, moving upstream of the weir. So first we would uh, take those numerical values and construct an energy depth function and if it's not easy like this, then we would actually just code the function into a, a spreadsheet or a uh, R script or whatever our tool de jour is. And we would compute a friction slope function. This friction slope function is <coughs> Manning's equation rearranged for the friction slope. So it's n squared, q squared over y squared um, over, over the area squared times the hydraulic radius to the four-thirds power. And so what's been done here is um, those have been um, substituted into the numerical values for this problem. The reason there's a y, the y squared here doesn't appear to have a constant on it is because it was one meter wide. And then we would start to build a table. I'm actually going to skip ahead. 
So some kind of table that looks like that, but let's see how we get each line of the table. So the first line is pretty easy. We have our starting section. We know it's flow depth. We calculate specific energy. We calculate friction slope. We have the bottom slope. There's nothing going on on the delta x in the stationing thing, and we're done. Then we go to our section two, and um, we've decreased the flow depth. So we calculate the new um, specific energy, the friction slope, bottom slope, and then we apply that in the uh, spacing equation to recover the distance between the two points, and we find out it's minus 209.3 meters. So the minus sign is indicating that we're moving upstream. The stationing would be x plus the delta x, so we're now at station minus 209.3. Then we go to the third line. We reduce the uh, flow depth again, new specific energy, new friction slope, same bottom slope. Calculate the new delta x, which is another, which is negative 215.1. So there's a calculation shown up there. And we uh, add the minus 215.1 to the minus 209 for our new station to minus 424. And we, and we repeat that as far as necessary. And um, in that instance, then we can uh, start to draw what the uh, water surface looks like. And here it's uh, depicted as x equals 0. We're 2 meters deep. We move minus 209 meters. We're 1.8 meters deep. And the person who drew the sketch has, has started to account for the bottom slope. And so this, in this case, it looks uh, pretty, pretty flat. Um, the other method that would be of value is a fixed step method, in which case um, we want to we want to prescribe the values of delta x and then solve the energy equation uh, for those particular values. So writing it is quite easy. It was written right there. E two is equal to E one plus S zero minus S sub f over delta x. But both the right hand side. And the left-hand side, they both contain the unknown y at section 2. So we, we come up with an implicit nonlinear difference equation. So in, in, in a practical matter, we need something like SWIM or HECRAS to uh, take care of this. Um, I have a uh, R script I'll show you um, to kind of illustrate uh, how that's done, but that's not the uh, focus of this class. We can also apply these to circular conduits. The shape doesn't really matter. Um, in the case of circular conduits, we start with our depth area relationship. And um, we could uh, build the circles into our calculations. In this case, we have Manning's N of 0 0.02, 11 cubic meters per second, diameter 10 meters. That's a big pipe, by the way. That's the 33 feet across, you could drive a car through that. And we suppose we have a downstream control depth of 8 meters. So we have this, this big pipe, big enough to put a choo-choo train in, uh, that is connected to water that's 8 meters deep at its downstream end. And we want to know what the um, water surface elevation looks like for 11 cubic meters per second flowing through that thing. So using the variable step method, uh, we would proceed the same way as the earlier example in a rectangular channel, except now it's a circle. And the calculations have now become tedious enough that we want to put it into a spreadsheet. So we start at section 1. We have uh, flow depth and pipe diameter, calculate alpha, calculate area, calculate weighted perimeter, hydraulic radius. Compute the velocity from the given discharge in the area. Compute the specific energy as the v squared over 2g plus flow depth. Compute the friction slope from Manning's equation worked backwards. Bottom slope is given. We're start, this is our first station, and so we're at station 0, water surface elevation 8. 
So that seems like an unnecessary calculation, but we actually need it for the next line. So let's suppose our flow depth decreases to 7.8, uh, diameter of 10, new alpha, new area, new wetted perimeter, new hydraulic radius, new velocity, new energy, new friction slope, average these two, use that bottom slope, compute a delta x. So our delta x is now minus 200 meters. Uh, compute the bottom elevation, which happens to be the bottom slope 0 0.001 times 200 meters, which is um, uh, 0 0.2. Um, uh, water surface elevation, in this case, is bottom slope plus flow depth, so we're still at 8 meters, but we're now at station 200 meters upstream, minus 200. Next line, we repeat the calculation, we get the station minus 401. Our water surface elevation is, is a wee bit bigger than 8 meters, and so on. And so we can continue those calculations, and uh, we're working our way down to um, normal depth for this particular uh, pipe. And when we get done, we can plot the bottom elevation and the water surface elevation. So we'll take a quick visit at the spreadsheets to do that and then we're going to call it a night. So this is not the same one as in the um, by hand example, but I think it will convey the necessary information. Supposing we have 11 cubic meters per second in a rectangular concrete channel, and the width is 5 meters, and our control depth is 2 meters. Uh, things we're going to need to compute is the normal depth, and then 5% normal depth. So, so this is actually a solution to an old homework exercise. And we want to find the distance until the flow depth is equal to 2.085, which happens to be the, it would be the um, <clears throat> critical depth for this channel. And so uh, we have our target values, and we can start producing different flow depths, and then we calculate the area, weather perimeter, hydraulic radius, everything, and we start getting our stationing information. And when we get, uh, get done, uh, we can make the plot of this. And this happens to be that example that was in the textbook that I showed the picture of. So this looks like a front on a curve to me. So this is coming out super critical, and we're producing a front water curve. So that's there for you to uh, examine if you wish. And then there's another one. <clears throat> Let's see if this is a different um, solution. Uh, this is a this is a much different uh, channel. It's still a rectangular channel. And now we're starting at 8 meters deep. And we're going back to the Normal depth of the channel, which is somewhere around 5 meters. Same kind of calculations. Um, we're after the delta x's, the station values, the bottom elevation, the sum of the bottom elevation, and flow depth is the water surface elevation. When we're done, when we're done, we can drag them up there and they'll go away. We can plot them. So this line is the bottom elevation line. The blue line is the water surface elevation. And then this would be useful, for instance, if we had some sort of object that uh, was located at, say, minus 8,000 meters upstream, and that object was at 10 meters absolute elevation. Uh, this plot would indicate that that object would be underwater. And we would have to decide if that is problematic or not. So depending on what the object is, um, 
and that, that's the whole point of these water surface profile calculations. So I will exit that, and again, you can examine that if you wish. Uh, let's do the circular channel. This one, I'm pretty sure, is the example that was just shown in the uh, slideshow. Indeed, it is. Let me get the picture out of the way, and we can see, keep your eyes up here on the formula line. You can see the formulas as you work all the way across. The angle formula, the area formula, wetted perimeter, hydraulic radius, velocity, which is determined from discharge divided by area, specific energy, this is just the specific energy formula, friction slope, and it looks um, complicated, but that's, that's Manning's equation for um, friction slope. Bottom slope is a constant in this case, and we're in business position one, so there's nothing to compute there. And then we um, reduce the depth and start calculating our way upstream. We find out we're at station minus 200, and it's working our way upstream. And when we get done, if we add the bottom elevation to the flow depth, we get water surface elevation. And then we're going to plot that one and that one. And here's our circular pipe. It had 8 meters deep at its downstream end. Uh, the pipe itself was 10 meters in diameter. So you, you can mentally picture a line up here that would represent the top of the pipe. Uh, normal depth in this uh, pipe for that flow rate is not very deep, about 1.5 meters. And so we see at this downstream end, we have this pool that propagates almost 7 kilometers upstream in this pipe before we start to get to um, the uh, flow depth that's becoming parallel to the bottom line, hence the normal depth. And, and so like before, uh, if there was some object in this region that was at absolute elevation of 6 meters, and that object getting wet would be a problem, a calculation such as this tells us it would be underwater, and then as engineers we could work out strategies to lower the water surface elevation if we could, or protect the object that's going to be underwater. And um, here is a R script for the fixed space um, case. So this is just this is just code which I I could run for you. Um, but I want to call your attention to this line here. So this is in a channel that, that starts out as 10 meters wide and then it has a section where it starts to get smaller down to 7 meters and then it gets wider up to 14 meters. So it looks something like I'll get a top view of what um, we're looking at. I think I saw one here just before. Maybe it's after here. Channel transitions. So something like this um, is what the channel looks like. Only everything's bigger than in this drawing. So we have a wide section, and it goes to a narrow throat, and then widens up again. So let me go ahead and run an instance of that. So uh, there's a script. Save it as junk. A junker. And uh, fixed space method for backwater curve. 
In this case, um, we have control over the spacing. So the delta x is uh, 3,280 feet for each um, station location. And we now want to find um, what the bottom elevation and the water surface elevation look like. Bottom elevation is just going to be a straight line. So we go ahead and we run this script. And it produces a drawing over here. And here's the bottom elevation. So up here is the wide part of the channel. And it starts to, um, to bunch up when we get to the uh, narrow part of the channel. And then when it starts to widen again, we get a low spot. And then it works its way down to its downstream boundary condition. So it's not outside the realm of um, constant step method of doing it yourself if you have to. Um, it, it uses a, a technique um, a lot like a lot like bisection. So it's it's working through each of these sections, um, guessing values of depth and adjusting them until you can make the section meet the condition and then moves on to the next one. So I will exit that. And that pretty much uh, concludes our discussion for today. And I will open up uh, this morning. There were some questions on homework. So um, I'm going to at least open that up. And um, um, answer any questions you might have. Okay, well, um, I want to wish you all a good evening, and I will see you next week, um, and have a great weekend. So thank you very much for your patience and attention, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Professor. Thank you very much, sir. All righty. Hey, I sent you an email. Can you check your email after class, please? Yep. Thank you. I'm going to end the meeting and then I'll check. Well, I, I'll check it right now. Okay, two copies. We extending. Okay, uh, I got the email, so I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the call, and then I'll reply to it, okay? Okay, yeah, and if, if you want to chat about it, I can um, I can talk to you afterwards, or if you just want to stay an email, that's fine, too. I'll look for the reply. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.